Hello, um, welcome to this uh, podcast. Um, I'm Dr. Hank Chambers. I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon at Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego. I'm a, um, also a co-editor of the journal Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about a topic that I don't know much about, but something that's really affected our field, and that is um, the subject of paper mills. Today, we have one of the world's experts with us, Dr. Jennifer Byrne, and I'd like her to introduce herself. Oh, thank you, Hank. Thanks very much for the invitation. Yes, so my name's Jennifer Byrne. I'm a molecular biologist and cancer researcher. So I currently have um, the role of Director of Biobanking in New South Wales Health. That's in New South Wales as a state in Australia. And I'm also a Professor of Molecular Oncology at the University of Sydney, also um, in Australia. So yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here and to talk about paper mills. Thank you so much. A, a couple months ago, I was on an editorial board meeting and the subject of paper mills came up and I go, what, what's a paper mill? Is that where they make paper? And why is that a big deal for us? And then all of a sudden I got interested in it and wrote an editorial that's in the uh, developmental medicine and child neurology. But as I researched this, I realized how little I knew about it. So um, Dr. Byrne, uh, may I call you Jennifer? Of course. Please call Thank me you. Too. So Jennifer, um, tell what is a paper mill? That's a very good question. I think, to be honest, uh, you know, paper mills are hidden organisations, so they're very difficult to study. They're a little bit like, you know, imagine studying drug cartels or, you know, human trafficking or anything like that. People are not really putting up their hands and saying that they're doing this activity. But paper mills essentially are organisations that offer publishing services that aren't disclosed. So that could be quite a range of services. But there's probably largely two models, and I think your editorial touched on both. Firstly, selling authorship on manuscripts, and in some cases, those manuscripts have already been accepted. Um, but in other cases, the manuscripts might just be at an early stage and authorships are sold individually. Uh, we also believe that paper mills sell manuscripts, entire manuscripts, to author teams. So there's probably two models. Wow. So how did you get interested in this subject? Why, how all of a sudden it came out of the blue? Yeah, look, I stumbled on it by accident and I think quite a few people do the same. So I found, originally I found five papers that were published on a gene that I'd cloned many years before. And as the person who'd identified that gene, I didn't think it was a particularly interesting gene in cancer and I had never studied it. But all of a sudden I found five people, five different groups that were studying this gene in cancer types where I thought this gene was probably relevant. Uh, so that made me a little confused. And then we started digging into these papers and realized that they were just including reagents that when they were deciphered, um, didn't make any sense. So a little bit like somebody saying that they're, um, you know, cooking a lemon pie, but when you actually decipher the ingredients, they've used a pair of shoes. <laughs> you know, it, it's just not possible. So yeah. when we discovered this, we sort of, I guess I'm a scientist and so I tend to follow things through and, and I, I guess I just want to understand what these, what these things were. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of, I, in retrospect, I've been getting offers from paper mills for, for the last, at least a couple of years where they asked me to be the guest editor of some journal I've never heard mm. of, or please submit this article. And and I think even some of my friends have been conned into being the guest editors and asked me to write a paper for them, but then please send $5,000. So um, I, just today, I guess I was preparing for this, I had eight offers to write papers for journals I've never heard of. So um, I, I think that's it's really exploding. Um, and dis dis yeah. dis discuss the, the scope of this uh, across the world. Um, yeah, look, I think you're right. I mean, some of those e emails that you're getting are probably from predatory journals. And so there is some overlap between predatory journals and paper mills, but paper mills also, unfortunately, operate in legitimate journals. That's one of the biggest problems. You know, they publish anywhere that they can, I think. Um, so the scale of the problem, look, we don't know. Um, just, but I would estimate in my field that there have been hundreds of thousands of these papers published. And I would estimate that in some fields, the majority of what looks like empirical research is from paper mills. So that's a very serious problem. Um, we have proposed that paper mills will essentially exploit, uh, they'll, they'll scale and conceal their products by varying four things. They look at areas that offer many topics, areas that offer many journals, 
areas that can be published by many different kinds of people in different countries and areas that remain relevant over time. So they'll continue to exploit an area while it remains scientifically relevant. And sometimes they can create the appearance of scientific relevance through their own activities alone. So they're very frightening. Well, so how, how does a scientist or just uh, someone's interested in the, in, the, in the field know that a paper's come from a paper mill? And you did because it was some of your research. Mm, and I know you right. looked at 12,000 papers and went mm. through that and found that. So how, how do we, you know, someone who's a- I think that's a, part of the problem mind. is that yeah. it's obviously difficult. If there's been yeah. so many of these papers published, they fooled a lot of people. But there are some signs. Um, so papers where authorships are sold, particularly prior to submission, they often have authors that come from very different places, where intrinsically it seems a bit unlikely that all of these people would have known each other and be working together. Yeah. Some paper mill papers, fortunately, really don't make much sense. But some do superficially make a lot of sense. Um, they're maybe some signs are very complex papers that seem to be authored by teams of people that don't have a track record with these very complex techniques but i would have to say it's really quite hard yeah it'd be really hard for you know a practicing clinician to know if this research is good and how you know how it affects patients i i had a uh i guess this was maybe more of a, a paper that gets through a lot of editorial um problems um you know, that I, I reviewed it for three different journals, turned it down each time, and all of a sudden it was in one of these, I guess, a predatory journal is what you're saying, but probably not a paper mill. And, and now that I know exactly what, what that is. Well, I would say it's often very hard to know. Yeah. It's often very hard to know. And you were said a lot of this comes from a, just a few countries in your paper. Um, is that still true or is it now expanding to, to more? I mean, China was well, one of them. and yeah. We, we do mostly see, um, like a lot of the literature that we study does come from China. And of course, there is, you know, high quality research coming from China as well. So yeah. this is a significant problem for researchers in China who unfortunately, are, you know, we, we sort of hear anecdotally from researchers that um, they're concerned that they're being sort of included in this problem when they have nothing to do with it. Uh, I think that another thing that paper mills are doing, like they recognise that this homogenous model of authorship, so selling a manuscript to a team where all those people probably work fairly close together in one country, that's now viewed as uh, a potential sign. So I think there are some paper mills that try to diversify their authorship. So they may have one author from a country like the US or Australia or the UK to sort of break down that model, which can make things obviously make the papers look more legitimate or more less like what's considered to be a paper mill production. Yeah, I think you may have answered this, but what are the, what are the threats to scientific integrity? I mean... Well, I think they're yeah, yeah, huge. And I think you pointed out quite a lot in your editorial as well. But I feel, you know, from my perspective as a basic scientist, I think these papers have tremendous capacity to mislead genuine research. Um, genuine research is almost by definition always difficult or expensive or slow or all three. And it can really take experimental scientists some time to work out that perhaps some of these results are, you know, invented and they will come to that conclusion through trying to reproduce those experiments themselves. And that can cost a lot of money and waste yeah. a lot of time. Yeah, it's hard to reproduce, get the money to reproduce others' research, I think, these days too. That's right. Yeah. So often people will do that in the context of a grant. You know, they'll get a grant and they'll go, all right, well, let's start by you know, we've got this hypothesis, it's based on the previous literature, let's start doing some of the reproducibility studies now. Yeah. Um, and they could waste a lot of time and money. Yeah, yeah, especially as bad. So kind of the new thing on the on the block is artificial intelligence. How, how do you think that's affected um, paper mills? Any, any, yeah. any, any, any experience with that? I think yet? a lot of people are very worried about that uh, because obviously paper mills will use any means at their disposal to create plausible papers at scale. AI will help them do that. Uh, I think a big concern at the moment is the use of artificial intelligence to create unique images that are not able to be detected through conventional methods which rely upon, um, you know, duplication or, you know, manipulation. So if paper mills can, can create entirely uh, plausible unique images, they'll fall through those kinds of screening methodologies. And I feel that people are already seeing evidence of that. 
And that's really happening in your field with histology and with genetics exactly. and all that. That's really the... Exactly. There's so many images in preclinical research shows images of, you know, Western blots and cells yeah. and mice. And, you know, these things can just be created through AI. Wow. And how can you ever figure that out? That's really tough. Mm. So what, what's what's the future and what are the possible solutions to this? I feel that probably the most, the immediate thing that we must do is raise awareness. We need to raise awareness within, you know, journal editors, peer reviewers, but also the research community so that researchers take a more careful look at the research that they choose to read. I mean, one of the things that does give me a lot of hope is that if there's one thing that researchers are great at doing, it's not reading papers. Researchers love not reading papers and they don't read a lot of literature. So all I think we have to do is say to people, you know, this could be a good excuse to just not read this paper. They'll do that. Yeah. So that's the first step, I think. Um, we also need much quicker and stronger responses from publishers. Publishers are putting a lot of effort into screening manuscripts. That's great, but that will only drive this arms race that we're in where the, the mill products will get more sophisticated and more hard, difficult to detect. So we also need journals to take really strong action when they suspect that a paper is from a mill, they need to do something about that quickly and decisively, not years later. That doesn't hurt the mill. Mills sell authorship and they probably move very quickly. So once the paper is published and the client has got what they wanted, if it's retracted a couple of years later, that makes no difference to them. Yeah. You have to you have to hit them quickly and hard. Yeah. Well, in your in your paper, you wrote that um, a lot of people, you know, they spend a lot of money for this because it, it, they get promotions and and it's going to be really tough to for you know, especially in lower middle income countries where their tenure and their rank depends on on the publications. Yes. But that's true everywhere, you know, and, yeah, and I, I think another concern is that as these products get more and more plausible and difficult to detect, it, they could start to tempt academics in virtually any setting who just need, you know, that extra one paper. Well, paper or... to get promoted, yeah. Exactly, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, Dr. Byrne, I thank you so much for uh, your expertise in this area and thank you for making us aware of this. Um, it's going to be tough over the next couple of years to to be an editor or a, re or a peer reviewer to, to get through these and, and hope we have some ethics in our in our scientific community. But thank you very yeah. much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Time. Thank you very much for your editorial and also for your interest.